so thank you very much for joining our collective teaching uh, towards building consensus to democratizing Africa's food systems during COVID-19 and beyond. As I said, I'm Andrew Benny. I'm, the, I'm a, a research and advocacy officer at the African Center for Biodiversity. Um, and Gertrude uh, Sharawayai is a member of Participatory Ecological Land Use Management, uh, PELM for short, in Zimbabwe. So I'm going to do a brief uh, introductory political framing. Okay, so in the dominant development paradigm, um, African food systems, and in particular small-scale farmers, uh, are usually described by their apparent deficiencies, by what they lack. But the COVID crisis is clarifying what many of us already know that industrialized food systems based on global value chains uh, and free trade are unsustainable and vulnerable to, and indeed, indeed cause uh, shocks. So already the World Food Program has warned that without drastic action, uh, the number of people experiencing acute hunger will double within a few months to 250 million people. And that's not to mention the over 1 billion people that already experience hunger and malnutrition in normal times. Yet organizations like the World Food Program and Food and Agriculture Organization are urging that all efforts must be made to keep, to keep global food supply chains functioning. But for many of us, uh, those supply chains have been part of the problem. They induce dispossession, inequality, poor health, and ecological destruction. So desperately trying to prop up the logic of global food supply chains, rather than using this as an opportunity to rethink the assumptions of a globally organized food system, amounts to fiddling while Rome, or more aptly in the context of the climate crisis, Africa burns. So for some, the COVID situation is a rehearsal for the climate-induced chaos to come, or it's even the beginning of the onset of this permanent instability, which without drastic shifts in our economies uh, and food systems and uh, away from industrial agriculture will be the new normal. So industrial agriculture is the largest single contributor to the climate crisis and biodiversity loss. While it's also been well recorded that Africa already is and will continue to be hit the hardest by climate change. But states together with agri-food corporations and development agencies uh, continue to promote the industrial agricultural model. Uh, what with some nods towards the climate crisis, which essentially amounts to asking Africans to dig their own graves in the context of the climate crisis. So industrial agriculture is also one of the primary drivers of biodiversity loss and genetic material in Africa, which is reaching alarming levels as well. So as a result of this, Africa faces multiple shocks uh, linked to industrial agriculture and climate change, where the erosion of agricultural biodiversity is linked to the proliferation of certain viruses and pathogens. So COVID-19, for example, represents a new symptom of the underlying issue. And despite the extent of scientific evidence, the neoliberal response has been to develop new technological band-aids that deepen inequalities and suppress diverse voices, knowledge systems, and practices that are in fact urgently required at these times. <clears throat> so we should make no mistake that capital uses economic and social crises like these to further consolidate and push its interests and ideas, what Naomi Klein has called disaster capitalism. In other words, capitalism never lets a good crisis go to waste, but in fact, neither should we. So pushing back against this requires strengthening the alternatives in practice and pushing clear political demands that are backed by organization. Small producers still form the backbone of the African food system, so the basis is there. The question is therefore how we as movements across the African continent continue in this moment to push back against capital, uh, to pressure the state to act in the interests of justice, and to advance and construct alternatives as we already have been doing, as with the political alternative of food sovereignty. So the inputs we'll receive on this teaching here today will help us deepen our discussion and understanding of how existing practices by small producers and traders, households, and especially women, uh, already represent the alternatives to the large scale industrial food system. How these activities are further evolving in response to the COVID situation, and the challenges we need to think about in taking these, <clears throat> sorry, in taking these activities further towards the longer term democratization of Africa's food systems. So the current crisis we face is a reminder for us to build a sustainable food system. This can be done by supporting small scale farmers, fisher folks and pastoralists who feed the bulk of Africa's population. Many of them are women and indigenous communities who are custodians of diverse seed 
land and water bodies. The farmers offer an alternative to transition towards an agroecological marketing system. They cannot access markets, post harvest loss are high, and the change in climate is affecting what remains of their harvest. The West blow suffered by farmers. Okay, sorry, Gertrude, yeah, it seems like you're back with us. Uh, can you continue? So these lockdowns are characterized by police and army brutality, movement restrictions, the undermining of farmers' rights and consumers' rights. So despite all these challenges, there are opportunities to make five shifts. First, a shift in how we define Africa's food system. Second, a shift in behavior for both consumers and producers. Policies, building a critical mass in support of agroecology is the fourth shift. And finally, in maintaining the past gains we have made as a movement, building um, towards the work that we have been doing on agroecology. Back to you, Andrew. Great, thank you, Gertrude. Um, I'd also just two things before we move on to the speakers. Um, just also like to thank uh, and note that this um, webinar was organized by a host of um, organizations from the African continent, um, including ACB was one of them, but also Pelham, uh, Zimbabwe, uh, the Rural Women's Assembly, um, and so on. So uh, just to acknowledge the, uh, all the connections and the solidarity that underpins this webinar. Um, also, secondly, if I can just make a note to the speakers to come, uh, if you can just make an effort to uh, speak slowly to assist our interpreters uh, so that they're able to translate. Okay, so we'll move into the first topic now, which is on uh, the political framing of the impacts of lockdowns on food systems in Africa, uh, looking at the threats, the emerging trends and the opportunities. So in this section, we have three speakers to bring us uh, perspectives. The first is Beatrice Maquenda, and she'll be followed by Claire Quenumma and then Charles Dewa. So we'll turn now to Beatrice Maquenda from the Rural Women's Assembly in Malawi, who will be speaking on smallholder producers and women in particular. Uh, over to you, Beatrice. Thank you so much, Andre, and good afternoon. So I'm Beatrice Maquenda uh, from the Rural Women's Assembly. Uh, pretty much um, in Malawi mostly, uh, I'm attached to an organization that also works with the smallholder farmers, NASFAM. And I'm, uh, as a Rural Women's Assembly, we are a self-organized network and mostly uh, around the globe and with many uh, countries in, in sub-Saharan Africa as well, Tanzania, Zimbabwe, Zambia, South Africa, and Swaziland, uh, Mozambique, uh, that, uh, that, that, that we are together, uh, pretty much as a self-organized in terms of uh, a movement that really looks at alternatives to, uh, to the current food systems. With regards to the situation at hand, the pandemic around the world, COVID-19, and I think we will not dwell much in terms of uh, the rising cases and the increasing incidences of uh, 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 cases on, uh, on, with the coronavirus. And I think the, inter the map uh, that is showing now, it, see, it sees with, of course, South Africa having as many cases as over 5,000, and then you see the rising number of cases um, that have now led to the different measures as would maybe highlight in the next slide. Uh, so in terms of the government, the different government response, we've seen a lot of, uh, um, a lot of uh, uh, measures around restricting people's movements, uh, a clear focus on having people to do social distancing, especially if they are in, uh, in crowded places or in public, uh, banning public gatherings altogether, including religious gatherings as well, uh, we've seen uh, restrictions in terms of even transportation, if we, especially for public transport, where the seating capacities have changed. And because of those such changes, we've seen that uh, um, transport costs uh, rates have gone up. So that's a contradictory in terms of uh, fuel prices have gone down in terms of the amount of gas prices. But because of certain restrictions around public transportation and seating capacities, you find that now even the transport rates have gone up. So uh, there's those dis the differences. 
And then we've seen other countries, of course, uh, um, uh, uh, instituting partial or full lockdowns uh, that further restricts uh, uh, people's movement. And in general, an increased uh, awareness and provision of uh, uh, personal protective equipment uh, where uh, uh, it's in some cases it's become mandatory uh, for people to, to have. So all these measures have been put in place uh, as preventive measures uh, to the spread of the virus, but they are very, the very same measures also that have threatened uh, uh, the livelihoods uh, of, uh, of women in more, uh, but also of, of farmers uh, in, in the different countries, but also they are very, very uh, uh, livelihoods that have also um, uh, threatened the nature of uh, democratization in as far as more access to both input and outputting markets and the like. So the threats that pretty much are very prevalent at the moment, uh, the next slide, we'll see that in terms of the marketing arrangements, these have changed, especially in areas where uh, partial or full lockdown downs have been implemented, uh, uh, where um, uh, there's restricting movements, and even in terms of access to designated marketplaces, there've been a lot of uh, uh, a lot of disruption in that case. And many of uh, of these rural women, really, uh, they are women that really rely on uh, um, uh, day to day sales, for instance. So most of them are producers of food, uh, but at the same time, they require uh, um, either in, an income to also access some basic uh, basic necessities for the, for their different households. So those kind of disruptions have really threatened in terms of uh, 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 their source of livelihoods, but also where eventually uh, they they are able to take their commodities. But and also within the uh, the, the, the with the restricted movements, it's also changed the way a social dialogue. Um, uh, continues where even seeds and food sharing also uh, has changed. And particularly uh, in this time of, uh, uh, at this particular time, it's coincided with the peak season where uh, most of the countries, it's harvest season for, uh, for, 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 for different crops. And in many cases, you rely on the, your social network uh, to at least maybe uh, employ on labor where you're harvesting and reduce the post harvest. So this has increased the labor demands even on the women where they would have to do it much more and pretty much with a broken social network that they can imply upon. So those uh, have really uh, caused a lot of uh, uh, anxieties, but also threats in as far as the food system is concerned. Next slide, please. Yeah, um, and then uh, for, for, for many, it's uh, because of the anxiety and the need to stock up and the need to, to make sure that the families are, are well, there's been a rush in, uh, in acquiring certain basic necessities that also uh, uh, it's increased the cost of living in, in, in some cases. But also most of the rural communities are engaging in uh, uh, this, the, the social safety needs, but also access to uh, village savings and the credit facilities that they've created their own financial system at that level. So that there've been also some kind of disruption in that case where the access to such kind of financial services has been disrupted. And in some extreme cases, because to make sure that the, pub, the, the, the citizens, uh, uh, the communities are adhering to this, we've seen cases of violence that have been um, that are, that has a, a, a arose, but also use of force so that people um, uh, adhere to these measures. So it's come with the different aspects, especially uh, at household level, where we've um, some have complained of increased uh, gender-based violence, but also even state machinery also imposing some force uh, that has resulted to some violence. So it's both in terms of the food system, but also the means and the processes onto which uh, the communities and the more especially the women uh, uh, have the inability to, um, uh, to access. But in any case, there wouldn't be, uh, uh, of course, uh, a producer on one hand, then you'd have an offtake on the other hand. So you find even the, the market access for opportunities have been narrowed down because even those that would be uh, that would buy their commodities are locked up and then not able to, but also they don't have actually the, um, the financial abilities to, 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 to purchase. 
And for this particular time, most of the countries uh, in the rural areas is where they go and replant and engage in winter cropping. So, so the basic necessities where they maybe access some, uh, some seeds uh, or maybe engage with the, in some of the agroecological practices with their groups, they've been unable to do that. And that also would further threaten uh, the continuity and sustenance of, uh, of, of their livelihoods. Next slide. Yeah, uh, and of course, uh, the one would question to say with this, of course, we were talking more of the challenges and the threats that have been. Are there any opportunities uh, that maybe we're seeing from a uh, from 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 about yes the opportunities are there because maybe now it's where we need to go back to the drawing book and see that uh, uh, the alternatives that uh, that are there that the rural women movement has been advancing in as far as agroecology is concerned in as far as the focus on food and seed sovereignty is concerned this is the time to make that one come to uh, to to play because we've seen that if we don't develop an ecosystem within a particular community that flourishes with on its own, they can be cut off. You cannot rely on the capital, uh, capitalist food system because that one, once a, a threat like this one comes onto play, then the people are, are, are cut off. So if we can promote can such alternatives and strengthen them, um, uh, they, they can strengthen them, uh, then they would be able to uh, to continue to, uh, to to do that. But also, it's uh, it's, it's it changes the uh, the narrative on what what is food and what is seed that we need to be promoting for the rural communities to to thrive and to place the rural women at the right uh, at uh, at the right center. So that rethinking does change public policy, but also it changes the way we engage with the rural women and in general with the food systems in general. Uh, but also to, to find that there is a better balance as we focus on uh, the interconnectedness of health, agriculture, as well as trade in, the, in, 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 the, in, in, in all this. And also, of course, harnessing the available opportunities because we cannot talk about democratization uh, if we don't make something available, something even as if some people don't even understand what this COVID or why, why is the, the, the whole world on uh, on freak in as far as these lockdowns and measures are concerned because probably information hasn't really gone out in the way it should to understand the operating environment at the moment next slide sorry beatrice um if you could just maybe start wrapping up in about 20 seconds please okay all right yes uh and and then maybe in wrapping up is to to, to say that uh, uh as as we continue to look at this we need to uh uh, to consolidate uh, the rural women, but also the communities in as far as uh, uh, providing the safety needs at the moment, looking at the short-term measures, but also uh, demanding um, uh, de demanding that the alternatives in as far as there's a lot of assistance that's coming into, into play and we have to make sure that that assistance is going towards uh, strengthening the alternative systems in terms of food and seed sovereignty, but also uh, 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 affirming and protecting the rural women and farmers' rights in the process. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Beatrice. Um, some great information to think about uh, the impacts on rural women of these lockdowns and the COVID crisis, but also where the opportunities to push for the interests and rights of rural women and food sovereignty might be. Uh, so to continue on this theme, uh, we'll turn now to uh, Claire Quinomne from Frolezon in Togo, uh, who will be speaking on women in the delivery of food products from rural areas to consumption zones. Uh, over to you, Claire. Yes, thank you, Andrew. I'm Claire Conom from uh, the Floraison NGO in Togo, in West Africa. And I'm the focal point of uh, the African Network on the Right to Food, RAPTA Togo, which is a member of AFSA, the African Alliance for Food Sovereignty in Africa. I'm participating in this conference on the topic women in the delivery of food products uh, from rural areas to consumption zones. Next, please. So we can say that women uh, play an important role in the food delivery, especially in West Africa, and I take from Cote d'Ivoire to Nigeria, and they were from the farm to the kitchen in the town. And women are the first food and nutrition 
if they give the first food and nutrition education to every person in life. Next. Yes. Uh, I'm going to just uh, draw our attention on women in the farm production, women in foods and uh, food processing, the techniques that they use in the delivery of food, how they trade and sell food products, and their business places, and women in facing the, the challenges they face in food delivery. Then I will come to the influence impact of COVID-19 on women in their food delivery activities. Okay, if we just take the part women play in the production of food, they work so that to provide cereals, vegetables, tubers, fruits, poultry, and sometimes they raise, they breed goods and sheep on farm. Then, uh, women are uh, in charge of food stuff processing and conservation in communities. So in doing this, women are, are in charge, particularly of this side of the food delivery. And doing so, they have activities such as drying, salting, smoking, uh, grading, frying, and also blending and mixing so that we have nutritious and healthy food. Then women have uh, different techniques to uh, work in this food delivery. They have traditional farming knowledges and presently they have knowledges in farming for those who have gone to, through some training. The traditional techniques that they have to conserve food stuff, they use herbs, plants, sun heat, fire heat, or smoke. Greeting with mortars, they have mortars, they have pestles, they have milling stones. Now they can use small equipment as mills, drying devices, juice extraction, which they have from farm tool handicraft men, or they imported uh, tools from neighboring countries such as Cote d'Ivoire and Nigeria. And sometimes they have tools from China and India. And they have also traditional packaging and containers issues. They use uh, leaves, calabashes, clay pots, etc. And presently they can buy some packaging and containers from the neighboring countries. Next. Women are in food trades and they are the one in West Africa in charge of the food products trades. And their trades on the products we have just seen, the cereals, the tubers, the fruits, chicken, fresh fish, dried and smoked fish. And they also trade on vegetables, especially tomatoes, onion, and peppers. Then these women sell those products fresh or processed in the way, traditional or present ones. Next, please. They can also sell cooked food in many of our cities and towns. You have the local food, small restaurants in the markets, in the streets. You have breakfast stuff in the morning, early morning in the street. You have lunch restaurants. You have dinner corners in the streets. And they also sell candies, sweets, toffees. They use the local products to process with granules, nuts, coconuts, cassava, etc. Next. Where are the women dealing with their businesses? For the production, they are on the farms. They are also in the trade in the local village markets. They are in the cities. You have big and small markets in the cities. They have the streets and the roadside in towns. They have the regional markets in the countries. And they have also markets in the neighboring countries in West Africa. Doing this, women face challenges. And these challenges 
are related to uh, a deficit in the following things. Uh, deficits in good storage places in the markets, deficits to have an access, an appropriate, to access to an appropriate container for food products. We have also the access to adequate packages for food stuffs, especially when they are, those products are fresh. There is also a deficit in the appropriate and adequate transportation to keep the quality of the food, especially Sorry, when- the, One minute left. Yes. Can I go to the COVID-19 issue? And in this COVID-19 issue, women have challenges to face in the, this measure to prevent the uh, pandemic. They cannot have early selling uh, activities, they cannot transport properly the fresh uh, products, they have to come to the market late and close early, and there's no more selling the streets at night. And the other issue is the economic uh, consequence on women business. They sell less than before, the revenues are getting low, and women cannot respect their commitment towards the uh, banks and microfinance schemes, and they are fearing that they can get into debt, and women find it difficult to face basic needs of their families. As a conclusion, we can say that women should be at the table for the discussion during the COVID-19 issues and also during the post-COVID-19 so that the voices can be heard in order to have a, an inclusive and participative contribution in food delivery in Africa. Thank you. Thank you very much, Claire. Um, okay, so we'll move on to Charles Dewa, who is with the Alliance for Food Sovereignty in Africa, uh, who will be speaking on informal markets and economies and the dominance of industrial food chains. Over to you, Charles. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, it's an honor to be on this interesting webinar. Yes, uh, I work from Zimbabwe, Harare, but mostly across Africa in informal markets. I've been looking at informal markets for the past 10 years, adding how informal markets function. Yeah, what I've seen is uh, across much of Africa, more than 80% of the food produced by smallholder farmers finds its way to consumers through informal markets. Uh, which apparently are not really recognized. And we're talking about Mbare in Harare, in Tundu, in Longwe, in Makola, in, in Accra, and in many other mass markets. And for some reason, even South Africa, which is arguably the most advanced economy, we hear that 60% of the food handled by Jobbik market ends up passing through informal markets all the way to consumers, which shows that mass markets are really powerful in Africa. And besides providing the diversity of food, freshness they are part of identity it's an identity it's an identity issue most markets are actually provide the herbal solutions they are not just for food it's more like they provide pharmaceutical products for, for ordinary people covid 19 struck when most countries were not ready really for it uh, unlike other diseases and uh, you know like disasters like cyclones and and and, and floods and other things the cyclone it took them by surprise. So the best option for them was to close markets. And because markets are considered congested areas, the idea was to say, let's close markets to limit the movement of people as in line with the WH or the restrictions of uh, restricting people from moving. And then we ended up having terminologies like lockdown and uh, the social distancing, which that don't really apply in much of Africa. So the decision to lock down markets affected a lot of people, especially low-income consumers and farmers and everyone else. The group of people who are affected on the production side are small older farmers who are into horticulture, who most of them have to buy food in order have to sell commodities in mass markets in order to afford to afford the so-called uh, uh, the so-called uh, basic commodities like sugar, cooking oil. Because they don't have income, they have to sell commodities. So if you close mass markets, you are denying smallholder farmers, horticulture farmers some food. 
Another group is that of those who are producing broilers and layers. These are chicken people who we have to get commodities from uh, urban centers. They have to get feed and, and the drugs for their commodities from, they have to get it from, from cities. And now with the lockdown, they can't do that. And then we have small order dairy farmers. These ones have to sell milk, milk has to be sold fresh. Now with the lockdown, they can't do it. And then we have pork farmers. These ones as well, they are affected seriously because the butcheries are not open and there are places called Gochi Gochi where many, many people go to roast some meat. These are some of the people who are buying pork. Now with the lockdown, they can't, they, they, they are not accessible. And then fisher folk, you know, I heard the colleague from Malawi mention fisher folk. Definitely, these are some of the people who have been affected as well as people who harvest uh, edible insects and indigenous fruits, which are very, very valuable at this time of the year. They are said to be very nutritious, but this is the time when indigenous fruits should be in the market, but they're not there due to the lockdown. Next slide, please. Uh, right, effects on the demand side have also been quite huge. Here we're talking about low income uh, urban dwellers who don't have the formal employment. These ones have been affected massively. For instance, in Harare, they constitute 60 to 80% of the 5 million people in Harare. These people, they, they survive on trading, informal trading. They constitute what we call the pavement economy or the street economy in Zimbabwe. And Harare has got 5 million people and 80% of them are, are constitute that. And this, so far, these people have been surviving without burdening in the government or donor money because they've been saying, look, we are making our own money can survive, but now with the lockdown, they can't do that. And banning this, it means millions of families have are exposed to hunger, starvation, hopelessness, and even school dropouts. Whenever schools are going to be open, there's not going to be any school fees for, uh, for, 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 for these people. Next slide, please. Right. One of the things that we have seen is the unfortunate dominance of colonial market systems. Uh, going across Africa, we see that most African countries have not shifted from colonial market, marketing systems where major uh, markets are located in cities. Nairobi, Lilongwe, Accra, that's where you find the major markets, which forces farmers to travel kilometers to sell their commodities. This is a mistake. Then it means now with the lockdown, people cannot travel there. There's no reason whatsoever why industries uh, should not be set up in farming communities as part of decentralizing food systems. This raises the importance of understanding our food systems and ecosystems. Most of our countries, have, our policymakers have not taken time to invest in understanding those ecosystems. Rather, they are more on the uh, uh, trying to promote industrial agriculture and food systems, which is why you find that uh, uh, in supermarkets have been kept open because they think they represent an extension of industrial agriculture, but mass markets have been closed. It shows our policies are skewed in favor of industrial uh, marketing, uh, industrial food systems. And by closing these markets, uh, super, by keeping markets, supermarkets open, it means most people cannot afford because prices are skyrocketing in those supermarkets. And even today, we see very long queues in Harare, every city people are queuing in supermarkets to buy food, which is very expensive. And for farmers who have not sold anything, they can't afford that food. Yet, what we have observed is that less than 15% of the food in Zimbabwe gets to consumers through supermarkets, the rest through mass markets. And one of the things is that now there's a promotion of maize meal. Yet, there's no cost-benefit analysis of to what extent uh, uh, drought tolerant maize varieties are better than small grains, which most people produce. COVID-19 has triggered a structural shift uh, that we think we need to think critically about pro poor empowerment models. It means we have to put our markets at the center. Uh, change, change that have happened may not go back. One minute left. So one minute left. Okay, so that's fine. Sure. Yes, we should think about coaching entrepreneurs to see how do they navigate their way around this, these problems that have been imposed by COVID 19. And we think organizing food and uh, proper supply chains will assist. In, in, they are really an important part of solving the problem. Uh, mass markets are very important. It looks like uh, our governments have forgotten that COVID-19 is not the only disease. We're fighting cancers, we're fighting malaria, we're fighting HIV, and many other diseases that require food. So by closing markets, 
uh, which are a source of food. It means we have forgotten about all other diseases, and that's a healthy time bomb which you shouldn't forget. I rest my case, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Charles, for shedding more light on markets, um, shedding more light on informal markets and economies and the dominance of industrial food chains. Um, just to remind our attendees, presentations will be shared with you after this uh, webinar. And please continue sending your questions and answers. For presenters who can respond to these questions and answers, it will be done in the Q&A. Now we move on to our next presenter, Stephen Greenberg from the African Center for Biodiversity, who will share lessons from South Africa, linking smallholder producers with community networks and relief efforts. Over to you, Stephen. Great. Thank you, Gertrude. Um, it's great to come after Charles now, because I think that what I'm talking about is building very heavily on some of the issues that he's raised here. Um, I mean, I'm speaking from a corporate dominated food system that we have here in South Africa, and I realize that this is not typical of most of Africa, um, but I think that it does have some lessons for limitations, especially on the kind of long chain corporate food systems. Um, so, um, immediate response to the, to the um, lockdown, um, in South Africa was uh, from civil society was uh, the formation of something called the C-19 People's Coalition, which was to mobilize a progressive response um, to the lockdown. Um, currently, there's over 300 um, CSOs who are part of that in a range of sectors of which food is one of them. Um, in, in Gauteng, which is the province where Johannesburg is, um, we established a food working group um, early on in the lockdown. Um, the immediate focus was to get food to those in need. So that was our first and primary concern because we know that lots of people suddenly, as Charles was saying, the survivalist economy, um, people just got completely locked out, um, had no income, had no way of, of getting food. So we realized this was going to be a problem. So um, we started off by gathering information on small-scale food producers around the province. Um, and, and quite surprisingly and amazingly, like around um, Johannesburg, where you think, okay, small-scale food producers, there's nothing there. But actually, there's a lot of people out there producing. Um, and then we also gathered information about distributors who could procure and distribute food. And so this was like a mix of charities, uh, volunteer initiatives, small-scale logistics enterprises, um, including these online food schemes, which have popped up in a few places. Um, and, and then linking to community organizing teams and townships and informal settlements who could gather information on vulnerable individuals and households who are in immediate need of food. Um, so the, the thing was to actually do a very practical job about trying to mobilize these networks to identify households in need of food and to actually organize the procurement and distribution of food um, to those households. Um, we set up a fundraising process um, to, to enable us to actually buy the food because obviously we can't be expecting smallholder farmers now to be donating their food. Um, uh, and um, We've got a mixture. We have a crowdfunding platform, which is just individual donations, and we also have um, community. Uh, sorry, we also have um, a proposal out for institutional funds, so development uh, agents and and others like these, so that we can get some big funds into this thing. Okay, and to date, we've raised around three hundred eighty thousand rand, with another about six hundred thousand pledged, and there are other promises. Although, um, honestly speaking, the donors have been very slow. Um, we had our network up and running within two weeks of the lockdown, and we're in week five now, and we're still waiting to get proper funding for the work we've been doing. But anyway, with the money we have um, got, we've delivered um, to 3,500 households to date, um, and obviously we will try and do more than that if we get more funds. So another aspect of what we're doing is looking at input supply. Um, specifically focusing on agroecological inputs to the small-scale farmers for their coming planting season. So there's two strands here. The one is that government has, has done some kind of disaster relief fund where they may provide some resources. 
Um, but then parallel to that, we're trying to raise other funds as well and to ensure that this is a kind of an agroecological approach, local diverse seed, seedlings, compost, um, uh, um, bio-additives uh, bio and things like this. Okay, so then a geo geographical clustering. So we've gone down to like a metro or a district level um, to link input suppliers, uh, small scale producers, small enterprise um, uh, distributors and communities into short supply lines, um, which are controlled by the participating activists and organizations and we're bypassing the corporate sector. Generally, I'll, I'll speak to some of the limitations just now. Um, Okay, I think government um, and corporations have been very slow to respond. The government capacity to deliver food is very weak, even if they're very efficient in terms of what they can do. Um, and um, they, they, there's, in here and there, there's some efforts to try and control um, uh, um, processes that are providing food outside of those formal channels. So they're trying to control and restrict and bring people into their um, own processes. And now I just want to make some, um, th that's just a bit of a background. Um, I think that the initial charity or humanitarian aid um, to meet immediate food needs quickly transformed into an issue of recalibration of food systems. And again, I think very much connecting to what Charles says, we're now talking about localized systems. Um, I think we are in an era of disasters now. I, I think this is non-ending now. And we've got the climate crisis looming on top of us. All of that stuff is still coming or is here already, as people know very well. Um, we should anticipate ongoing restrictions on movement and travel in order to contain and spread this virus. If we think we're going to go back to the globalization of the past, we know that future pandemics are going to be inevitable. Uh, okay, this one was about respiratory issues. The next one might be about kidney failures, and then everybody will be scrambling around looking for kidney machines. The next one will be something else. It's going to be a constant process of trying to catch up to what's happening to us now as humans. We're not in control of this process as a species anymore, I would argue. Um, so I, I would say that we're at the end of globalization as we, as we know it, um, and we're entering into a new era of localization, and we need to start preparing the ground for this. Um, some serious fragility has been exposed in our, especially in South Africa, our centralized and concentrated corporate food system, an over-dependence on a few very large food manufacturers. So you have problems now with these large factories that are petri dishes for the spread and mutation of the virus um, and the breakdown potentially of long supply chains in the, in the coming months. Um, an over-dependence on imports for food and for agricultural inputs. I mean, in South Africa, the commercial sector, the commercial agriculture sector relies on 90% of synthetic fertilizers from imports. So what are we going to do in this condition? This is a result of a long historical unbalanced trade regime that, it, that, that has been imposed on our countries. Um, market failure has also been exposed. Uh, markets only respond to effective demand, which means only people who can go and buy food at the supermarket. All these people who, who are basically really hungry, um, uh, th this um, crisis and lockdown has revealed this chronic underlying hunger very starkly for a lot of people who weren't really aware of it before. One minute left. What's that? One minute left, Stephen. Oh, goodness, one minute. Okay, so, um, so I think we need to respond to this in a number of ways. One is domestication of production into our countries. Uh, localized food systems, short supply lines, um, the public sector to support open air food markets, again what Charles was saying, small scale farmers and enterprises including collectives as the basis for the localized food systems, homestead production of fresh produce, uh, community controlled and responding to need regardless of whether people have money or not. If we can deliver in times of intense lockdown and crisis, why should we not continue to develop and strengthen these, al these alternatives as conditions ease? Um, so I think last sentence, those who are going to survive the best are those who can produce their own food and the inputs required to produce their food in the future. Preferably, they should be collectively and democratically organized. Um, 
this is not just an opportunity to advance this now, but it's also an imperative for us. Thanks. Thanks very much, Stephen. Uh, so we've had quite a comprehensive input from Stephen on attempts to strengthen smallholder farmer uh, systems and linking it to consumption and so on in the very corporate dominated food system in South Africa. Uh, so from here now we'll move up to Uganda with uh, Rehema Boguma, who's with the Food First Information and Action Network, FIAN, uh, in Uganda, who's speaking on the impact of the lockdown on farmers and small scale fishers in Uganda. Over to you, Rehema. Thank you. Hello, our listeners. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I will talk about the impact of lockdown on farmers and the fisher folk in Uganda. Um, I'll start with the fisher folk. First of all, uh, like in many countries, apart from the lockdown and the restrictions in movement, we have uh, uh, what we call the curfew. There are specific hours when everyone is expected to be inside their houses. In Uganda specifically, this is from 7 p.m. to 6 a.m. in the morning. Nobody is expected to be outside during those hours. Now, you, you realize that fishing is normally done at, at night. Fish is normally caught in the night. Um, the normal by 7 p.m., for example, fishermen will go to the lake to cast their nets and then collect them somewhere in the middle of the night, like at around 2 a.m. So with these new rules that nobody can be outside at night, this has completely shuttered down the fishing activities in many of the fishing communities. Um, at first, um, fish, fishermen tried to resist and tried to go fishing almost by force, and they were thoroughly beaten in some of the communities. And, so at the moment, everything is down in many of the fishing communities and nobody can go fishing. Uh, because during the day, you, you, you can't go fishing. Normally, the, the waters are warm and so the fish is really deep down in the lake. You can't, you can't get it. And besides that, uh, fishermen were also restricted. Uh, they, they, couldn't, uh, they couldn't allow more than one person in the boat. And normally, there are two or more people the boat to, to be able to catch fish, to do all the, the work that they are supposed to do while catching fish. So um, this lockdown has had really, uh, I mean, it has had negative impacts on everyone, of course, but on the fishermen in a, in a very unique way. Um, apart from the curfew, uh, like my other colleagues have said, everywhere business is down. Now, business in fishing communities is not only the fishing, there's a lot of trading, there's a, there are a lot of um, shops, uh, and all those people that are operating and doing business in the fishing communities are the ones that provide market to these communities. So when everything was locked down, many of these people shifted and went back to their places of origin after realizing that they will not be allowed to continue their operations in these communities. So majority of the people in fishing communities settled there um, to engage in fishing related business. So when they went back because uh, activities are closed down, there is still no market, even if the curfew was to be lifted. So if, if for example, curfew is to be lifted tomorrow, it will still take time for, for people and for life in fishing communities to get back to normal. Um, these people have also been affected uh, because factories have all been closed down. Like everyone else has said, um, when factories are not working, a lot of things uh, are stalling. Uh, our president gave directives about two months ago and asked all factories to either close or provide accommodation for their workers. And of course, many of these people are not able to provide accommodation for the so many people that are employed in the factory. This meant that factories were, no, factories that were buying fish from the uh, fishermen and process it either for the local market or for export. So all this has completely put down the fishing business 
and ultimately has affected millions of people, including the fisher, the people themselves, the traders, and, and the consumers. Women in, in a special way have been greatly affected. Uh, women depend on normally what we refer to as secondary activities in fishing. They provide labor for sun drying of silverfish. Women also cook and sell food as, as business uh, to the fishermen and, and other items. So women in these communities, especially those that have children and they cannot shift, uh, move from one place to another like the men do, are greatly affected. And in fact, many of them are starving because of the fact that they are not as flexible. They can't quickly move from these communities to other communities because they have children. Um, now, on the side of farming, when it comes to farmers, uh, in Uganda, about 83% of our population survive on subsistence agriculture. So um, on the positive side, Farming is one of the activities that was allowed to still go on during this lockdown. So our president said farming should not stop because the country depends on farmers and everything. Whereas that was very good, the circumstances around do not allow farmers to continue at all. First of all, the, market, the markets are down. Towards lockdown, people were all encouraged to stop maize flour and dry beans, which food would take you a long time. I mean, because it's dry, it won't get spoiled so quickly. And, and many people who could afford did that. And what does that imply? That implied that people are now not in position to buy fresh food because people had um, to buy food in bulk, uh, dry food, and, and kept it. So, Whereas uh, the farmers are doing the farming on one hand, they have not been stopped, but then who is buying the food? Nobody. Secondly, my colleagues have said, most of the big markets in our country have also been closed completely. And, and because uh, it was noted that these are the uh, biggest risk for the spread of COVID. So they have been closed. And so the farmers continued growing food while the markets are closed. And, and this has put farmers, many farmers, in, in a crisis. Then all microcredit institutions, microfinance institutions, have completely closed down. There are for farmers and, and also the fisher folk who normally depend on loans. They depend on getting money from lending institutions to buy their agricultural input, to buy the fish nets. Everything has stopped. In, in our country, like, like you must go to the, to the bank to ask for a loan physically. There's nothing like online processing of, of loans or anything. So when, when there is no trust has been cut off, this puts everything to a standstill. Therefore, uh, we think that it's important to support small scale farmers and the fisher folk in a special way. We need to have uh, food reserves to create food banks where such vulnerable people can be supported in, in times of crisis like this. Unfortunately, at the moment yes. in the country, the food distribution that is going on in the country is only targeting the urban poor. So we also need innovative marketing strategies so that farmers... Riema, know. So uh, I was saying that we need innovative marketing strategies for farmers and instead of relying on the traditional marketing systems that are breaking down when they, they are starting and uh, such preventive measures like of, uh, that is happening now, of, uh, preventing people from getting such diseases, this should be done in such a way that special attention is paid to certain categories of people depending on their nature of work, like the fisher folk who, who cannot fish during that day. So we need to appreciate the different contexts and see how such measures are tailor-made to suit the different circumstances. Thank you so much. Great, thank you very much, Riema, for sharing the experiences of fisher folks in Uganda. It feels um, the experience on this topic, we have two presenters to share their perspectives with us. First, we will start with Nyarazai Brenda Muronda from La Via Kambasina, Africa. Nyarazai, please do address the, the audience. Good day, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much, it's a pleasure to be talking to you. I'm just going to be adjusting my camera a little bit. So 
Uh, as introduced, my name is Nyara Zaid Brenda Munda. I work with Lavia Campesina Southern and Eastern Africa, based in Harare, Zimbabwe. Um, Lavia Campesina Southern and Eastern Africa is part of the global chapter of Lavia Campesina, and we are also one of the founding members of the uh, AFSA Alliance, just by way of introduction. And um, I would like to begin by saying, I think this COVID-19 situation is kind of like one of the biggest global events in, in the recent decades, which goes on to highlight and uh, clearly outline the existing inequalities in the globalized uh, economic system that we have. I think my network is a bit, so I'll be switching in and out of the video. So you find that currently what is happening is that the most vulnerable communities are suffering the most with no access to healthcare, loss of jobs and income, no access to water, and then we have a looming food crisis as informal markets are being shut down. And this concerning issue is the rising of tensions, which arises from issues of nationalism that are being that are cropping up from the national governments as states scramble to kind of like deal with the uh, COVID-19 uh, crisis, which excludes some of uh, what I would say our fellow African our fellow African communities from getting access, I will give, I think maybe in the example of South Africa and other countries, where now aid and support is being nationalized. And you find that uh, one of the issues that will arise from that, that we are seriously concerned about, are the issues of this, with these closed borders, issues of xenophobia, which have been recurring within our region, are also some of the issues that are going to emanate pretty much uh, sooner or later. And with regards to the whole idea of collective organizing and reconstruction, this would be something that would be greatly affected. And then you find that previously, Africa's food systems have always had small scale food producers as an integral epicenter or part of, uh, part of the solution or part of the supply chain. Cultural practices, traditional practices such as seed banks, sharing of information, exchange of and sale of their own local seeds, breeding of livestock, and um, keeping, I think, most of the best attributes. These have been some of the practices, farming practices that have always been within the African uh, food system. But the onslaught of the capital. Multi-layered in the in, in the case that you find proffered solutions that are cascading from the top going downwards to the communities, and then an attack on our traditional kind of farming by capital and the whole industrial mode of agriculture, or in the name of um, I would put in quotes food security, while trying to maximize profit, has not helped. Our situation he has not helped us to be independent. This is exacerbated also by the pressure that is leaned on on our governments and our states to support this industrial or commercial model, which is not which currently right now it's glaringly clear that it's not sustainable. It is not going to be helping us in this situation. Peas and farming communities, small scale food producers have been threatened by massive land grabbing, transnational corporations coming in, monocropping, carbon offset deals. We find farms, large tracts of land being taken, and uh, peas and communities being displaced or to put uh, forests. And then the whole idea of criminalization of uh, seed serving practices by small scale food producers. This, all these have not helped us in terms of us being independent, in terms of, so the, this whole onslaught also of the prescribed climate solutions to the climate crisis, which are, which are again coming not from 
our own information or our own consultation because we've realized and we all know and kind of like acknowledge that we already have homegrown solutions that our small scale food producers have been implementing that have been working but these are not recognized because they do not align or are not aligned to the industrial model and they do not and they do not at the same time uh offer any profit making solutions to to the capital so i find this 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 prescribed solutions what i would term for solutions have also further caused the devastation and ravaging of the livelihoods of small scale food producers because we already know that the climate crisis has affected us deeply especially the global south southern and eastern africa region you have one minute left all right okay thank you and then the whole idea of the land tenure system so with all this i think for us what we are calling for is that all recent developments in the uh, in the african seed harmonization uh process including ips and gm technology that they put a moratorium on all this with a view to revoke and reform regulations and policies towards support for food sovereignty and based on the foundation of the uh united nations declaration of the rights of peasants which recognizes peasant agroecology and other sustainable methods of food production to be the epicenter of um uh democratic food systems in africa i think that is our our saying how we are going to going to be proceeding forward i thank you thank you nyaradzai for pointing the challenges uh, as well as also, um, challenges faced by small scale producers as well as offering some of the challenges we now move on to hear from david otieno from the kenyan peasant league david please do take over yes thank you very much uh, i'm david otieno from the kenyan peasant league uh, kenyan peasant league is a member of uh, la via campesina Sorry I'm in the field so you might get some noise from the background but I'll try to be more clearer and uh, a bit faster. Well as my colleague uh, Brenda said is that uh, uh, the crisis uh, that has come due to coronavirus has actually just added to the uh, problems that the small scale farmers have been having because you find that um, the inequalities that have been existing due to global globalized neoliberal system patriarchy uh, and a system that excludes the majority so you find that uh, uh, the coronavirus crisis has just added to what has been there and uh, you 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 find that uh, there are, there's a lot of uh, analysis about the impact of coronavirus people are talking about age talking about uh, people who are sick but they they forget one clear uh, factor that the coronavirus is affecting classes differently uh, things like uh, uh, restrictions uh, uh, things like uh, closure of markets while we have supermarkets operating we are having a uh, big restaurants operating while you find the small scale people or those with small shops selling uh, goods from farmers are being restricted so you find that uh, such ones uh, such issues have led to loss of jobs and income as my colleague have said we have had situations whereby people who can't pay electricity have their uh, powers cut off there's no water and we 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 have also had uh, like situations where health centers have been closed especially in Kenya due to coronavirus they find that uh, um, uh, people go to uh, get services but their numbers are restricted so you find that uh, this effect affects mostly the small scale farmers but you find that um, given the globalized nature of the food system where most of the farm inputs uh, are imported into the countries uh, coming through high seas and the coronavirus has actually disrupted this global chain so you find that uh, the farmer managed seed systems or the farmer systems are coming out are, are coming up uh, handy for example in kenya we have had situation of where by in the north rift where the farmers who have been, were, were, have been relying on uh, imported seeds imported farm inputs are now demonstrating they are asking the government to give them the seeds while you find that the the farmer the localized farm and seed systems are now becoming handy in that uh, for example in kenya peasant league right now we are having an increased demand of farm managed uh, farmer saved seeds uh, people are calling and saying can you get the, the, t- this particular type of seeds that underscores uh, the value of the small scale farmers and uh, especially the farmer managed seed, seed systems 
uh, and also you, you find that uh, within the communities, things like schools, uh, I mean, uh, you find that the government of Kenya is, is promoting e-learning for the students. And you find that most students of small scale farmers or the people living in rural urban areas, they cannot access, they don't even have internet in the first place. They don't even have smartphones to access the, 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 the education materials. While the government is saying that the national exams are going to be on time. So we have seen communities organizing themselves uh, within the neighborhoods, coming up, mobilizing teachers to take care of the students. We have been seeing young people uh, helping older people to grow more food uh, uh, for the people. And most importantly, you, you find that um, uh, we have also seen when markets are closed, we have seen the cluster systems among the farmers. Because farmers within a cluster or within a particular movement, they know another, they know farmer, this particular farmer has vegetable, this other one has base. So despite the closure of market, we have seen interactions between the various groups of farmers in the in ensuring that the, that chain of, of food is, is maintained. And most importantly, uh, my colleague has talked about a recent agroecology, uh, which is now coming out as a way, because if you have seen that, because movements have been closed, most factories have been closed down, there has been a reduction of global emissions. It tells you clearly that the peasants are not responsible for uh, global warming, that are responsible for greenhouse emissions. While, they are not involved. Even right now, they are ignoring the small scale farmers and the peasants. Yet, you find that now they are becoming very handy. So, the peasant agroecology, which we are, the, the, the farmers have been practicing, is actually now becoming important. When you look at, for example, the differential effects in terms of um, the government of Kenya suspended loan, loan repayment for, uh, for microfinance loans, and then these microfinance organizations closed down, they are no longer issuing any loan. Uh, so, and you find that uh, uh, the indigenous uh, resource pooling systems are now coming handy in the sense that people can, can borrow from one another. So it, this is also uh, uh, indicating that uh, uh, the peasant way of life is actually sustainable and it is localized and therefore it cannot be affected uh, by, the, uh, by the global disruptions. Nonetheless, uh, you find that uh, movement of food, for example, uh, from rural areas to uh, urban areas is, has been disrupted because the government is calling for licensing. Uh, for example, Migori County to Nairobi County is around 350 kilometers. You pass through around six counties and the government was that in each county you have a license, licensing. Uh, so you, it costs around uh, 110 US dollars to get a license that can, can put you through from uh, Migori County, Nairobi County. And, and, and uh, so you find that uh, despite this dis disruption, we are still seeing uh, food coming into, uh, into the city. From Very the city. Yeah. Yes, so in short, what I would, what I would want to say is that um, uh, while uh, the, most of the analysis is talking about the crisis that has come from coronavirus, the peasants have been in a crisis even before. We have been facing all these problems. And it's good that even now, uh, the people who have been oppressing the peasants are, can now also be faced by this. And that's why we are calling upon uh, all the peasants globally on the movements to ensure that as we move post-coronavirus, post the input of the peasants is very important in ensuring that in future, then we can be resilient and respond to such a crisis. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, David. Um, for giving us that perspective on small farmers and I think the really crucial role played by collective action from peasants and small farmers from below uh, around collective putting your resources, seeds and so on. Um, thanks very much for that. Um, <clears throat> so we've had a great uh, set of uh, inputs today giving us a wide perspective from across various parts of the continent on uh, the impact of COVID on especially small farmers um, uh, and food producers and fishers and women producers. Um, but also where the negative impact, uh, but also helping us think about where the opportunities are, and the <clears throat> strengths are in small uh, producer systems for taking forward um, our alternatives. So we're going to hand over now to Francis Davies from the Zambian Alliance for Agroecology and Biodiversity, uh, ZAB, who will just help us with a summary uh, from all the great inputs that we've had today and the work ahead for that, that these will raise for social movements. Uh, over to you, Francis. Thank you very much, 
Um, thanks, I hope everyone can hear me clearly. Um, this has been a wonderful time to be together um, in a time where we are all so dislocated um, from ourselves and um, from, from the communities that sustain us, both the earth and, um, and each other. And so I just firstly want to just thank everyone for coming together and thank the African Centre for Biodiversity for initiating this. Um, and, and this is a collaborative, um, a collaborative act um, to really reclaim who we are as people on the African continent in responding to this crisis that we are facing and this crisis that is calling us to fundamentally change everything that was before because before is what's got us into this crisis in the first place. So just um, thanks also to the, just to mention the, the others who are part of this, this work, uh, Zimbabwe, Pelham Zimbabwe, um, the Rural Women's Assembly, the Eastern African, um, Eastern Southern African Smallholder Farmers Association, um, AFSA, uh, which is a continental wide movement of civil society organizations, pastoralists, fisher folk, um, and FIAN, Uganda, FIAN throughout Africa internationally, uh, Lavia Kapsina, and myself from the Zambia Alliance for Agroecology and Biodiversity and um, shout out to all the Zambians who connected. So there has been a lot said today um, and I'm not going to do justice to summing it up, but I think really what we have seen is that we all know the horrors of what we're going through and the horrors of a false solution to the crisis that we face. We have been locked down, we have been locked out of markets, and we have been locked away from each other. And the fundamental element um, that really defines us as Africa is our connections and our social fabric. And that's what has sustained Africa for years, despite for decades, for millennia, despite um, in the last decades with the onslaught of the globalized agriculture system, um, what has kept people alive has been our social networks. Um, and this is really what has been so severed in the responses and the false responses to the COVID crisis. Um, and so, so really, as an immediate response, what has been called for is contextualized responses that keep producers and consumers at their absolute core. This needs to be the response that people can take back ownership of our food systems, of the way that we produce and the way that we share food. That has been, that has been, that power has been taken away from us as Africans because of the corporate industrialized food system that has got us into this problem in the first place. So the call really as a, as a, as an, as a group of civil society, as a movement of, of organizations um, and farmers, um, and many, many hungry people in Africa is to say that it is now time to reclaim our food sovereignty, um, that we need to reclaim power back to, to define our own food um, and how we produce it and how we share it and reclaim back African food systems and, and our markets. Um, so I wanted to just highlight some of the key points that have been made. Um, and Gertrude at the beginning mentioned five paradigm shifts that we really need to, to take forward um, as civil society and as individuals um, in, 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 in the transformation from this crisis. Um, and that is how we define our African food systems. Um, there's a notion that they are backward and traditional and we need to, we need to claim back power to redefine um, redefine our own food systems, to localize those food systems, to claim back power. We need a shift um, in behavior uh, from producers and consumers, going back to localized short value chains based on agroecological production of um, sustainable food that, that is produced um, in ways that, that are in harmony with the earth again, rather than in ways that are destroying biodiversity 
um, and, and destroying ourselves in the first place. Um, a huge, a huge step is that we need to a fundamental shift in our policies. And at the core of this is ensuring that our policies shift towards supporting agroecological farming systems rather than supporting corporate industrial agriculture. And at the, at the basis of this is ensuring that farmers' rights are legalized and are respected in all countries across Africa, that we recognize farmer managed seed systems at the core of our food systems. And this has really been exemplified now in that farmers, there was a, a said before um, in this work, in this panel that um, farmers, everyone is, is clamoring for our own localized, our own seed, um, for traditional seed. And the only way that we're going to survive this is if we, if we can produce our own food. And farmer managed seed systems are at, at, the, at the basis of this. Um, this is respect of, of farmers' rights and of consumers' rights, um, which, is, which has been exemplified in the lockdowns of how people have, have been severed from each other and severed from our social networks. So we need to build this critical mass um, in, in Africa and working together. And I think this is a really great um, start in, in a show of the collaboration that exists across Africa with the networks that are already there. I think what is so important in what is coming up in how we, how we realize that, so how we see the transformation happening is that there are pockets of, of resistance, there are pockets of resilience and, and restoration that exist throughout Africa. Um, and, and it's it's at this time that these these pockets um, that exist of communities who are reclaiming back their localized food systems, who are are producing their food in an agroecological way, who are who who have their own traditional seeds still, um, it's 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 their time to flourish, to 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 claim back power, um, and and these are the sites. Where, where the lessons already exist to, for us to go forward. Um, and so, and so the, the personal and the organizational, everyone's responsibility in this time of crisis is, is how do we fundamentally transform what was normal? Normals got us into this crisis in the first place. We have destroyed the biodiversity around the world that is the heart of of our existence and and we need to go back to to protecting our biodiversity um, and and that is at the center of our response and so agroecology provides a framework that we can that we can take this forward agroecology provides a framework that we can have a transition a sustainable transition to to resilient um, and agroecological food systems. So that is a call um, in, in how we proceed. Um, and I'm going to hand over back to, to Andrew or to Gertrude, if she's there. Um, and just to, to thank everyone for coming together at this time, um, in this time of crisis, um, and thank everyone for, for their, their work that is sustaining farmers and and bringing people together at this time of crisis. Uh, thanks Thank very you. much, Francis. Uh, that was great. Um, yeah, I think the, the, as Francis, you, you mentioned, we have the answers as movements, as organizations, as collectives of small scale farmers and fishers and producers. Um, and the COVID crisis is definitely a time uh, where shifts are happening and will happen. And so it's also a question of uh, organization and political demands and so on, uh, but of course also of power. So uh, these issues that um, uh, we've been experiencing before COVID uh, will continue in certain ways as well after COVID. Uh, and so we still have uh, a lot of uh, work to do, but our strength is, as Francis mentioned, um, our ideas, our capacity for organization, um, and which I think is represented here in 
uh, all the partners that came together to uh, organize this um, this webinar, as well as all the people that have uh, participated and joined this this webinar, and all the small scale farmers and movements across the continent fighting for uh, more just and democratized food systems. Great, thank you, Andrew, for that. Uh, maybe just to close, I would like to thank our partner organizations. I would also like to thank our um, presenters, our translators, and our attendees for making this webinar a success. We will send you the links regarding uh, the re recordings and some of the related documents. We hope that you stay safe during this challenging time, and we look forward to further engagement in the future. Be well and goodbye for now.